It's great to welcome all of you here tonight uh, for the panel discussion on humanitarian intervention. Um, the event is co-hosted by our Center for International and Regional Studies, SEERS, and the American Society of International Law, ASIL, which is an NGO that holds special consultative status to the Economic and Social Council of the United Nations. I'm particularly grateful to Dr. Professor Nuha Abu Dhahab for organizing tonight's event. Professor Abu Dhahab is chair of the Transitional Justice and Rule of Law Interest Group at ASIL. Uh, but she's also uh, a professor here, and she uh, teaches courses on transitional justice and international law. Her courses are very popular among our students, uh, many of whom are with us here tonight and who will soon be grappling with some of the same issues we will be discussing tonight. As Georgetown University Qatar students pursue their undergraduate degree in international affairs, they actively interrogate the interaction of law and diplomacy through courses such as the history of law, Islamic law, public law, and laws of warfare, informed by regional perspectives and the cultural diversity of our campus. What makes an undergraduate degree in international affairs in Qatar special is that students get to see and experience diplomacy in action. Qatar, in many ways, is diplomacy in action. Ranking national and foreign officials and diplomats are often in our classrooms, offering real-life perspectives. Our students visit local courts, participate in internships with embassies and ministries, and meet diplomats through clubs and activities. They learn directly from policymakers and diplomats and begin to understand that law and policy are works in progress, ever-evolving. When they graduate and become proud alumni, they contribute to change, whether at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Qatar, at the UN, or in a classroom by pursuing an academic career. Uh, Dr. Abul Dahab's expertise and network enabled GUQ to provide a platform for tonight's dialogue around key issues in international law, bringing together researchers with policymakers. Thank you. This type of dialogue is not only inherently interesting, especially as it addresses, as it will tonight, issues such as whether humanitarian interventions can include going to war. And I know that that's the piece that we will be discussing and that you'll be presenting on Sarah Lee. It is precisely the kind of discussion that we are having tonight that helps span the gap between the researcher and the policymaker between the scholarly and the practical. Let me end by saying that I'm particularly delighted to be welcoming my good friend Sarah Lee Woodson, whom I have known since her days with Human Rights Watch in New York, and who was connected to my nephew, the lawyer with whom she worked on, uh, I think, human rights law in a Palestinian context. In Iraq. In Iraq. In Iraq. Which brings me to another connection that we have, and I will use this as an opportunity to pitch the talk that will be given on March 5th by our mutual Iraqi friend, Omar Shaker, um, from Human Rights Watch. Omar uh, covers Palestine, Israel for uh, Human Rights Watch, and when uh, the Israeli government basically kicked him out and uh, refused to um, renew his residency. Uh, I saw him there at the YMCA two days before Ken Roth, the then uh, president and CEO of Human Rights Watch, went to um, uh, Israel-Palestine to escort Omar out and uh, had a press conference at the Tel Aviv uh, uh, airport. Uh, since then, Omar uh, has been living in Jordan, covering Palestine-Israel out of Amman, He's become a very good friend, along with his new wife, Sarah, and my understanding is that they're now in Chicago, where Sarah is pursuing her PhD. Um, and Omar will be coming here to speak as part of the Palestine series, a series that I'm particularly proud of and uh, very grateful to my colleagues, Karine Walder and Abdullah Larian, 
uh, for leading uh, the spectacular series. So we're looking forward to, so tonight we have you, Sara Lee, and in a couple of weeks, um, we will have um, Omar. Omar was also responsible for uh, the, the uh, Human Rights Watch report um, that describes Israel's practices in all of historic Palestine as apartheid. Um, but I'm delighted that you're here. I'm delighted uh, Fadl uh, Abdul Ghani is also with us here tonight. I'm delighted, uh, Nuha, that you have organized uh, this amazing event. And uh, with that, I thank you. I thank you for attending, and I turn it over to you, Nuha. Okay, thank you, Dean Masri. I know you can hear me. Can you see me? <laughs> These podiums discriminate. All right. Good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to this event on um, a critical and controversial issue of uh, humanitarian intervention. Um, I'd also like to thank Georgetown University and everyone who um, helped to make today happen. And I'd also like to thank the American Society of International Law um, and Georgetown Center for International and Regional Studies for co-sponsoring tonight's event. Um, debates on humanitarian intervention are important because they, they have policy implications, but also, of course, they impact the lives of millions of people. Um, this idea of intervening militarily uh, in a situation to prevent or to stop mass atrocities raises so many moral, political, and legal questions. But also, what does history tell us about whether humanitarian intervention does indeed help to stop or prevent mass atrocities? Um, does it make sense to advocate for humanitarianism through violence? Do the ends justify the means? Um, what do the experiences of Rwanda, um, Kosovo, Darfur, Libya, Syria, the Rohingya, what do those experiences tell us about humanitarian intervention and its sort of born again uh, form known as the responsibility to protect? Who is doing the intervening? Um, who should be doing the intervening and how should intervention be practiced? Should calls for humanitarian intervention be made sometimes on an ad hoc basis when nothing else works? When might it be a good idea, or is it a good idea? Is it ever a good idea? Um, when the act of humanitarian intervention itself leads to mass atrocities, how can we continue to invoke it? But on the other hand, if we don't invoke humanitarian intervention to stop mass atrocities, what is the alternative? Now, I have to say I am so glad that I'm not on the receiving end of these questions. And I'm looking forward to um, the exchanges tonight between this stellar panel of scholars, practitioners, and human rights professionals for whom I, I have uh, deep, deep respect. Um, so I will quickly introduce our speakers and I'll explain the format of tonight's event and then we can finally begin. So Sarah Lee Whitson is the Executive Director of Democracy for the Arab World Now. Prior to that, she was the Executive Director of Human Rights Watch's Middle East and North Africa Division for about 16 years. Um, she's led many investigative missions throughout the Middle East and has published widely on human rights and foreign policy in major international and regional media outlets, including the New York Times, the Washington Post, CNN, Foreign Affairs, and many others. Um, it's, a, it's a real pleasure to have you here with us, Sarah, so, so thank you for joining. Um, Tonight's event is, is centered actually on some of the arguments that Sarah Lee made in an article she published last August on the issues that human rights organizations face when deliberating over their positions on humanitarian intervention. Um, and a few weeks after uh, that article that Sarah wrote was published, um, I bumped into Fadl Abdel Ghani, um, as we often do, at a human rights conference somewhere in Europe, I can't remember where now, was it Belgium? Okay. And um, during one of the breaks uh, at this meeting, I asked Fadl if he had read, if he had come across Sarah's article, and then we, we had a very long conversation about it. And it was, at, it was at that conference, it was during that talk that we had during our break, that the idea for tonight's event was born. And so I'm, I'm delighted that that idea has now become a reality. Um, 
Fadl Abdel Ghani is the founder and chair of the Syrian Network for Human Rights. He's a human rights advocate um, and has also led many investigations into human rights violations in Syria. Fadl engages with policymakers and international organizations around the world, um, and he has served as an independent consultant on human rights for the Syrian opposition during peace negotiations. Um, I'm very grateful that you were able to join us tonight, Fadl. Now, I'm also delighted to introduce Professor Asla Bali, right here behind me. Um, hi, Asla. Uh, professor Bali is um, a professor of law at Yale Law School. Her work is widely published and focuses on public international law, um, including human rights law and the law of the international security order, as well as comparative constitutional law, with a focus on the Middle East. Um, prior to Yale Law School, Professor Bali was professor of law at UCLA's School of Law. Um, and Professor Bali currently serves as co-chair of the advisory board for the Middle East Division of Human Rights Watch, um, and she serves on the board of many other organizations and journals. It's a real pleasure to have you with us, Asla. Thank you for joining. Um, and finally, I am delighted to introduce Professor Aisha Shabukshu, who is Associate Professor in Human Rights and co-director of Human Rights at the London School of Economics and Political Science. Um, her research and teaching interests are in social, political, and legal theory, as well as political violence and transnational social movements. Professor Shibukshu is committed to public engagement, and she has authored many publications, including ones that I enjoy teaching in the classroom here at Georgetown University in Qatar. Um, she's also the author of the book, For the Love of Humanity, The World Tribunal on Iraq, which was published in 2018. Aisha, thank you so much for joining us. Um, I will now give the floor to Sarah Lee, who will speak for about 15 minutes. Uh, Fadla will then respond, followed by Azla and Aisha. Sarah will then have a chance to react to, to the discussant's comments, after which we'll then open things up for discussion, and of course, we'll take some questions from the, from the audience. So, Sarah, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Noha, and thank you to Georgetown University and Dean Masri, how delighted I am to see you here, um, for inviting me here to talk on the topic of humanitarian intervention in issue in which I have been engaged for three decades. That's, that's a scary number, but it is the, the truth. Um, this is, as I was just saying to Noha, arguably a deep in the weeds discussion, not just about why unilateral military intervention for the stated purpose of stopping atrocities is a very problematic contact, uh, concept, but why advocacy groups, foreign policy groups, the foreign policy community should not support calls for such intervention. Um, this is something that I spent over a decade arguing and debating and fighting about at Human Rights Watch. And at Dawn, my new organization, part of our mission is to engage in a critique of the foreign policy community's methodology, approach, and analysis to the Middle East, not just the policymakers, but the foreign policy community, the human rights groups, uh, the think tanks, the, the academics, um, to critically examine our methods, our means, because those of us in the human rights world have been at it for some time, and the results aren't very pretty, the results aren't very good, we haven't been very successful. So we really do need to question our methods and means and methodologies. And this focus on the uh, advocacy for humanitarian intervention, I thought, is an important place for us to start on some self-reflection. So for those of you who are students, I would say, you know, you are really participating in the the, the same discussion that we are having at the highest level of the foreign policy community's leaderships about these issues. And what I'm saying to you today is exactly what I'm saying uh, to my friends and my partners at, at Human Rights Watch, at International Crisis Group, at Amnesty International, at Cairo Institute for Human Rights Studies, at Brookings, Carnegie, and so forth. I mean, this is literally the exact same uh, uh, discussion. Um, so, understood most broadly, humanitarian 
intervention is a military intervention, often unilateral and without UN authorization, so it's not authorized by the United Nations, to prevent or stop atrocities. And, and while humanitarian intervention can include humanitarian things like delivering aid, the key point is it's an intervention and it breaches the sovereignty of a country for stated reasons of good. And so the heart of this question is when can a country go to war effectively, carry out an act of war, whether to deliver band-aids or tents, uh, or whether to carry out regime change because the regime in question is uh, 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 carrying out atrocities or planning to carry out atrocities. A number of organizations whose work includes focus on international humanitarian law, which I'll say IHL, uh, and armed conflict, Amnesty Human Rights Watch, Physicians for Human Rights, and International Crisis Group in particular, because those are the organizations whose records I really examined in great detail to see what their positions have been over the years. They support or have supported this concept of humanitarian military intervention. Human Rights Watch has an explicit policy authorizing it to call on a state or states to intervene unilaterally and militarily to prevent or stop mass atrocities uh, or other similar crises based on certain criteria, and I hope uh, you'll focus with me on this criteria because it is the heart of the debate. Um, while Amnesty International's policy is limited uh, to UN authorized interventions, so uh, it, it uh, uh, has a little more uh, uh, restraint on its calls for intervention, only if the UN approves. So these criteria, the same, though, across all the organizations basically requires them to make a judgment that the intervention will cause more harm than good. Um, it will stop the atrocities, um, and it will do more benefit stopping atrocities than the harm it will cost, uh, death, destruction, destabilization to the intervention. It's really a, a, a cost-benefit analysis uh, at some, and this is the analysis that governments undertake or advocate for to justify an intervention or to oppose an intervention, and it's really the same analysis that advocacy groups uh, undertake when they decide whether they should support an intervention or not support an intervention. Um, I believe these positions on humanitarian intervention raise really serious concerns about the role and responsibility of our foreign policy community, of international humanitarian law organizations, in propagating war and war making. However rarely invoked, I think that these calls reflect an outdated and distorted worldview that centers the United States and Western Europe as exceptional and exceptionally good-willed foreign policy actors and anoint them privileged, exceptional powers to wage war, even outside the framework of existing law as articulated in the UN Charter. So my organization, Dawn, recommends that organizations in the foreign policy community review and reform their policies to abolish these mandates, authorizing calls for humanitarian intervention, and to develop their work and recommendations to take seriously and prioritize the right to life, including by calling for an end to armed conflicts and arms sales globally, which they do not do. So, the criteria. The standard criteria for invoking military intervention are themselves problematic, subjective, and entail a tremendous amount of guessing and hoping for the best. I think they reveal the inherent shortcomings of any military humanitarian intervention. First of all, mass atrocities. What's a mass atrocity? There's no generally agreed criteria for what constitutes a mass atrocity besides defining them as large-scale systematic violence against civilian populations. Take, for example, the recent conflict in Libya, where the UN Security Council Resolution 1073 authorized military intervention for humanitarian reasons to prevent atrocities against Libyans revolting against Gaddafi in 2011 at a time when his forces had killed approximately 350 protesters. The NATO-led intervention then went on to become a regime change operation as NATO forces bombarded the capital, as well as Gaddafi and his fleeting, fleeing, defeated convoy in the west of the country. Nevertheless, there was global sentiment that Gaddafi was uniquely evil, who needed to be stopped. 
I think propelled at least in part by broad public sympathy for the Arab uprisings, as well as evidence of thousands of protesters in Egypt, Tunisia, Bahrain, and Yemen gunned down. In none of these other countries did any international law organization advocate for military intervention while the attacks on protesters there were underway. There was no general questioning whether these deaths were a sufficient mass, either relative to other atrocities or as a unique event, to justify a military intervention that would and did cost at least as many civilian lives. It is, I think, this criteria of mass atrocities to justify military intervention more than any other that subjects international organizations to appropriate charges of selectivity, where attention to and sympathy for one party of a conflict appears dictated by media and political exigencies as opposed to any objective criteria. As I noted, no organization urged military intervention to protect civilians during violent attacks against protesters in Egypt or Yemen who face far worse atrocities by their government at the very same time as the Libya intervention was debated. Similarly, and in striking parallel, though many endorsed NATO's 1999 military intervention in Kosovo, citing the deaths of 1,500 civilians there in 1998, no one called for a military intervention in Palestine, where Israeli forces killed 1,500 civilians in 1999. There has been no call for humanitarian intervention since, whether in Palestine, where many thousands of Palestinians have been killed in several attacks by Israel, nor has there been any call for humanitarian intervention for Yemenis subject to the US-backed Saudi Emirati war in the country that has left half a million people dead. Finally, I think it should be noted that justifications for military intervention based on the existence of atrocities can also have the perverse impact of encouraging groups to exaggerate or even invent atrocities as a means of triggering a desired foreign intervention. This was the case, for example, in Libya and Syria, where there were widespread, highly publicized claims of mass rape of women during the early parts of the conflicts by Libyan and Syrian security forces, which turned out to be false. Last resort. The notion of military force as a last resort is also a difficult criteria to establish, laden as it is with subjective and often faulty determinations based on incomplete information available to us. The extent to which diplomatic efforts have sincerely been tried, the extent to which covert military interventions frustrating any pretense of diplomacy may already be underway, as was the case in Syria, the extent to which political, military, and economic interests are pushing for a military intervention and downplaying or undermining the prospects of alternative options for conflict resolution, as we're seeing in Ukraine, these are legitimate lines of inquiry that are at best debatable, but very like, unlikely to allow us to answer with certainty that military intervention is truly a last resort. More good than harm. The most important but glaringly difficult, if not impossible, criteria for international organizations to satisfy before endorsing military intervention is that the military intervention is more likely to do good than harm. Given the extent to which the very notion of military intervention conflicts with, even undermines, our core mandate prescriptions of human rights organizations to uphold human rights, including the right to life, in addition to the other serious costs, such as the cost to the organization itself reputationally, there should be a very strong and very clear conclusion that a military intervention would definitely do more good than harm but there seems no practical, realistic way for any organization to reach such a conclusion, frankly, much less a government trying to make that judgment. The very process of asking the question of good versus harm further exposes the biases of the organizations themselves, fraught as they are with notions of trust. A lot of this comes down to who you trust. The answers often depend on the worldviews, backgrounds, and personal experiences of the staff as opposed to a neutral evaluation of objective criteria. Syria is an excellent case study where those advocating for unilateral military intervention by the United States ultimately believed as an article of faith 
in the capacity of the United States to be a good and reliable actor whose primary motivation was to save Syrian civilians. But broadening the question to look at the historical and regional record of the US exposed similar biases. Despite the very recent devastation to and grotesque abuse of civilians in Iraq due to the US invasion and occupation, Despite a record of global atrocities by US armed forces going back decades, despite the ongoing military support for other regimes in the same region committing atrocities at the same time as Assad was committing atrocities in Syria, some remain convinced that the US would be an agent of good in Syria and that whatever harm and intervention would cost civilians in the short or long run would, well, in the words of former Secretary of State Madeleine Albright, telling us how it was worth it, uh, uh, the sanctions on Iraq, well, it would be worth it. <clears throat> Finally, the very absence of criteria to answer the question regarding good versus harm means the answer is always incomplete. For one, judging the good that results from preventative intervention is factually impossible to measure as it will always remain entirely speculative absent a written record of imminent plans to massacre tens of thousands of civilians. And while the theoretical lives saved good is happily deposited on one side of the ledger, the anticipated harms, prolonging war and harm with the introduction of new military resources, regionalizing and internationalizing a domestic conflict into a proxy battlefield, to name just two, they can be casually dismissed as speculative or remote. There's also a particular short-sightedness in endorsing military intervention as a measure that will do more good than harm because it buys into the notion that the causes of co and consequences of armed conflict begin and end with the fighting of the moment and that lives can be saved at the barrel of bigger, stronger guns. Even the successful intervention of Kosovo in 1999 was not a mere act of military intervention, but required and still requires the presence of NATO peacekeeping troops in the country over 20 years later. So a realistic and honest call for intervention would have to contemplate decades of peacekeeping and humanitarian, economic, and political support for the country we intervene into, likely pursuant to the presence of decades of occupation forces. That in all, in all likelihood would not be a call that any state or international organization would find acceptable to make, especially given the US track record of state building. Note, Afghanistan. Organizational damage. Very briefly, I'll touch on the internal and external dangers of international organizations endorsing humanitarian intervention, including a drain on organizational resources, increased security risks to staff, and the costs to an organization's mission and reputation. Most significantly, to the extent that the interveners themselves carry out killings and other abuses, these harms become the responsibility of the international organizations because they ask for it. They will be seen, they are seen, as having contributed to the abuses themselves and undermine the mission of their organization to uphold human rights for all. Particularly for Western-based international organizations, such a call exposes an arrogance in making a decision to call for war, an act that always entails killing in a foreign country without the consent of the invaded. While partisans to a conflict inside a country may well seek foreign military intervention for a variety of reasons, it's impossible for international organizations to seek or obtain the consent of the invaded, although it is the invaded people who will bear the greatest brunt of any such intervention. There's this thing called neutrality. It's the myth of neutrality in international humanitarian and human rights organizations. Some international organizations, while the same time that they are advocating for humanitarian military intervention, generally say they don't take sides in armed conflict or examine the legality of a war, whether it's just cause war, whether the war is legal itself, so that they can preserve their ability to conduct impartial investigations into violations of laws of war, 
uh, uh, that the world and parties uh, to the conflict greet as such. In addition, they argue a strict position of neutrality ensures access to conflict territory similar to that of humanitarian organizations delivering aid and a degree of safety for staff as neutral investigators. But in choosing to endorse wars for humanitarian reasons, those concerns about neutrality just seem to fade away without any apparent discomfort with the inconsistency of their position. At the same time, there's no other exception to this policy of neutrality, like calling for a ceasefire or a halt in hostilities for humanitarian reasons. So these organizations will endorse a call to war as an exceptional measure to save lives, but they won't endorse an exceptional call to stop war, to cease fire, because somehow that tarnishes their neutrality. I think the myth of neutrality, particularly at Human Rights Watch, is revealed not only as a problem of internal organizational inconsistency, but as a broader bias of the organization to recognize and internalize the precepts of US primacy in the world. This seems particularly marked at the International Crisis Group as well, which takes US military dominance and leadership as a given political reality, assumes its overall benevolence, and never concerns itself with the damage wrought by the United States because of this militaristic interventionist policy. So these organizations will conduct investigations focusing on particular incidents of unlawful conduct or reports focusing on conflicts in particular countries, monopolizing organizational time and focus on the trees with scant attention, actually no attention, to the forest, the forest of powerful, wealthy, enabling governments that are waging many, many wars, many, many interventions, many proxy wars around the world. I think these factors make it possible to contemplate calls for a humanitarian intervention by the US, despite so much evidence and analysis of its anti-humanitarian conduct to the contrary. The internalized and biased perception of the United States and Western Europe as global leaders for good distracts and diverts from critically needed work to challenge US and Western European primacy in ordering world affairs, to hold these governments to the same human rights and international law standards as states more routinely criticized, and to oppose their chief role in the global dissemination of war machinery, including, as I mentioned, endless armed conflicts, support for proxy fighting forces, and providing weapons to abusive and unaccountable governments. Now, who are the targets of advocacy for positive action, humanitarian action in other countries, including political pressure, sanctions, and intervention? It is always the US and Western capitals who these organizations turn to, with both spoken and unspoken assumptions that they will act in a benevolent manner to uphold rights, while critical advocacy of the United States or Western misconduct remains muted and underfunded for reasons of subjective bias, yes, fear of losing access, yes, and credibility in powerful capitals, yes, and also hampering the career prospects of staff who may seek eventual jobs in the US government or the UK government. I think the war in Ukraine now, one year on, is an appropriate coda for our consideration. I said a year ago, it's fair to predict that the vast majority of staff in international organizations are advocating for a US-led victory in Ukraine, supportive of the over, I don't even know what the number now is, I'm sure it's well over the 50 billion that I wrote some months ago, in military support to the Ukrainian government, and would see it as a legitimate form of military intervention, even if not formally pressed to take that position. Now, Amnesty has opposed Russia's invasion of Ukraine in a new and exceptional policy to criticize military aggression. But are Amnesty and other organizations remiss in their commitment to preserving the human rights of Ukrainians to life if these organizations are not challenging the continuation of the war, which is likely to turn Ukraine into Syria 2.0, mark my words, pushed for diplomatic options, 
and question the harm that will come to Ukraine if billions and billions and billions and billions of dollars of weapons to the country continue to flow for the next five years. If they use every weapon we give them, even if the Russians don't fire, the country will be rubble. Will it really be enough for international organizations to document abuses by all sides but never call for a ceasefire? Has not happened one year into the war. I think it's time for international organizations to evolve as the broader policy community and public have evolved, as our organizational staff have diversified in our criticisms of the US and Western capitals for their role in war making and abuses around the world. As experts, as those of us here, all of us here, with privileged access and influence, many based in the US and Western capitals, these organizations have a greater responsibility to take on the misconduct of the governments, defense industries, and foreign government lobbyists where they are based, and that quantitatively and qualitatively are responsible for a great deal, if not most, of the harms of armed conflict around the world. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah Lee, for that powerful opening. Um, you left us with a lot to, to think about, and I'm looking forward to uh, the responses. So, Fadl Abdel Ghani, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Noha, and uh, many thanks uh, to Georgetown University and uh, a uh, powerful presentation from Sarah, which is make uh, life li my life difficult to respond. Uh, so, I, uh, I, I argue on contrary, should the human rights organization not demand intervention outside the framework of the Security Council to protect civilians in the event of extrajudicial killing amount to crimes against humanity? So three parts. The first part is the basic criteria for humanitarian intervention, the responsibility to protect. The second part is Syria is a flagrant case of the failure of Security Council and the failure of, and the failure to intervene to protect uh, civilians, which is called aggravated losses. Uh, part three, why the West? So the first part, intervention is a complicated concept in international law because it is overlap with the central concept in international law, which is sovereignty. There are many types of, of intervention, and what we are talking about in discussion is one type, which is military intervention, for the purpose of protecting human rights. Uh, when government commits a terrible violation against its people, in internal armed conflict. I'll discuss the right to intervene, what is the position of human rights organization on it. So first I prefer to use the term responsibility to protect instead of the right to intervene. So after every case of military intervention or non-intervention, uh, jurist would debate. Recently, it's happened after uh, the military intervention in Libya and non-intervention in Syria and Yemen. Previously, after the intervention in Somalia, Bosnia and Kosovo, and the non-intervention in Rwanda. The principle of responsibility to protect is based on an idea that states should, out of their sovereignty, protect their citizen from avoidable catastrophe, from mass murder, from mass rape, from famine, but those states are unwilling, when those states are, are unwilling or unable to, to do so, the responsibility must be borne, must be borne uh, by international community. Here we mean the responsibility of the Security Council under Article 24 of the Charter of the UN to keep in international peace and security. The responsibility to protect include three successive levels. Responsibility to, to uh, preventation, 
Uh, so addressing the root and the cause of the conflict, responsibility to respond. This includes coherence measures such as sanction, um, the establishment of um, an international lawsuit, and in the most extreme cases, international, uh, the military intervention. Third, the responsibility to of reconstruction, that means after the intervention, uh, to provide full assistant, um, uh, especially uh, we are talking about recovery, reconstruction, and reconciliation. With regard to military intervention, three principles were established, which are, in, in, in short, uh, the just uh, cause threshold. There is the, this threshold. So that means uh, uh, if, if, if there is significant loss of life, especially the life, the, the killing, um, actual or apprehended, or major ethnic cleansing, actual or uh, apprehended. The second principle is uh, percussionary. That uh, the intended is um, uh, the intent to correct. That's um, why it's preferable the operation uh, be uh, uh, multilateral. Um, that intervention uh, is the last resort. And that intervention uh, is uh, uh, proportion in terms of duration and intensity. The third principle is correct principle, probably by the UN uh, or um, getting um, uh, the permit. Uh, but if the Security Council failed, uh, it's possible to restore the General Assembly through the uh, United for Peace resolution. It's not binding, but give an image of legitimacy uh, to the military intervention. Now the question is, after all of, th of these stages, so we are here, we are, we are discussing all, after all of those options, and the Security Council have, uh, has failed. Um, and its history is filled of failure to respond to a very clear cases that threaten international peace and security. Do human rights organizations stand here or do is demand to protect of civilians outside of the frame of Security Council and outside the frame of the General Assembly in the event that does not respond as well? And if uh, an alliance of country is formed and this alliance take into account the, the previous criteria and succeed in this mission, it will, con it will consist a, uh, a severe blow uh, to the UN and its credibility. So let's take Syria as a case study. Um, Syria, uh, as all of you know, um, there is a conflict uh, after uh, a uh, the uprising started you know, on March 2011. So I will just highlight key points. The first key point is September 15, 2011, the High Commissioner issued a report covering the events that took place between March 15, July 15, 2011. The investigation mission conducted that the Syrian authority practiced killing civilians with gun, machine guns, uh, snipers, using helicopters, and the conclusion was uh, that um, this is, um, uh, um, was part of widespread systematic attacks against the civilian population, which may amount to crimes against humanity. Okay, the second key point is the report fr from the Independent International Commission, the Commission of Inquiry, was issued November 23rd, 2011. The report indicated that the extrajudicial killing in Syria has reached 3,500 civilians between March 15 and November uh, 8, 2011. And this is also, uh, the, re the report included many other violations, but we are focusing on the extrajudicial killing. 
Um, by the end of 2011, the Syrian regime forces killed nearly 12,000 civilians. By end of 2012, the Syrian regime killed approximately 80,000. By end of 2013, the Syrian regime killed 140,000. Um, today, the total death of civilians uh, exceeded 200,000 Syrian citizens. Those are the documented one. So this is data, not an estimated figures. Uh, the use of chemical weapons is also different stories, which is, took place by end of 2011 and continue up to 2018. So therefore, we are facing a situation which all previous integrants are available, including the failure of Security Council in spite of 24th a resolution issued by the Security Council and um, the Assad regime continuity of killing. So what should the human rights organization demand? Keep monitoring and documenting violation um, without any extra st step? I do think that this is, um, uh, uh, I don't think this is accurate. I believe that in all the previous condition, if the all previous condition are met, then the role of a human rights organization is demand to protect of the civilians by all means, including military intervention. This is at heart of their human rights role, and I do think that um, that uh, contradicts uh, this is n they, di they didn't contradict the objectivity in documenting violation of all parties because we must differentiate between uh, the uh, based of um, and the 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 uh, originality uh, that the government uh, and the state responsibility that the government started the those um, uh, violation and uh, the size of the violation as as well. I argue that human rights organization, when in situations similar to Rwanda, Syria, and Yemen, if they didn't demand military intervention to protect civilians, then they abandoned their role uh, and send a message of hopeless to the civilians. This demand doesn't mean that countries will do so, because it's obvious that they are about their interest but we are talking theoretically and legally. The Security Council has stated in more than one resolution that the systematic and widespread violation of international humanitarian law and human rights law in situation of armed conflict may constitute a threat uh, to international peace and security. I don't think that we should stop a charter of the UN uh, nearly 80 years after it was written, but we must criticize and develop it, set a standard by which Security Council must interfere, and plan the possibility that when the Security Council does not interfere, what is the legal position? Are we letting the mass killing continue without demanding to stop them? I do think that the military intervention in Syria since 2011 or 2012 would have caused all this huge uh, amount uh, of demand that we are reaching in uh, 20, uh, uh, all of this damage which we are reaching in 2013, or perhaps years before that. And it's inaccurate to say that it's not possible to make a comparison between the extent of, of the current damage and the size of damage that would occur in a case of um, uh, the intervention. As there are criteria that can be relied upon through observation process and historical experience that uh, contribute to giving an approximate uh, percentage uh, that is uh, acceptable to some extent. So finally, why, why is the West? There are many points. Uh, the open, opponents of um, the military intervention need uh, to base uh, their point of view, which is, I think, 
need further discussion. So why, why is the West one of them actually? And why we don't call uh, on the West uh, to, interven to, inter uh, to military intervention against their allies country? In the discussion of uh, uh, protecting civilians, I think it's self-evidence to turn to democratic country, to countries than um, that respect the human rights like, like um, England, uh, Germany, um, France, US, rather than addressing um, China or, or, or Russia. Those countries, uh, the, the West, despite of um, the presence of many black sp uh, spots in their history, remain um, almost the only option. It's impossible to ask um, Russia, for example, or China, or similar countries, they are uh, uh, like, um, uh, with, um, they are the one who is uh, justifying all types of violation based on sovereignty. I believe that human rights organizations um, are um, uh, critical of um, uh, the practices of Western allies, such as Saudi Arabia, Israel, and Egypt. And uh, that doesn't prevent them uh, to request uh, uh, military intervention by those countries when uh, extrajudicial killing uh, took place in, in other uh, states. Another key point is the failure that occurred due to military intervention. Dictatorship countries exploit, expo, uh, exploit, um, exploit uh, this uh, failure. I think that this is unfair to blame military intervention entirely for the failure uh, of the political transition in Libya uh, or other countries. Um, certainly there are standards that military intervention must took in account during uh, implementation, such as adherence of international law, uh, compensation of victims, um, and in addition to the post-military. Uh, such as following uh, the transitional, uh, the transition of power, peacekeeping, reforming the armies, the security sector, protecting minorities, uh, and holding war criminals accountable. Human rights organizations have the role of monitoring the implementation of the military intervention and its uh, compliance with the standard, monitoring the post-military uh, um, intervention state, recording violation and condemning the coalition that carried out the military intervention in case it committed violation, even though it was the one that called for intervention previously. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fadl, for that. Um, Asla, we're going to go straight to you. We're running a bit over time, so. Um. Yeah, thank you so much, Noha, and it's really a pleasure to be here and to share the stage and thank you so much to the organizers and of course particularly you again Noah for having all of us um, engaging with this important topic. Uh, mindful of time I'm going to try to keep my comments brief. This is in part because um, you know my views dovetail very closely with those of Sarah Lee Whitson. I myself recently wrote a policy brief for the Quincy Institute titled The Humanitarian Paradox Why Human Rights Require Restraint in which I argued against coercion-based um, policies to address human rights violations. Uh, Sara Lee mentioned at the beginning of her comments that her sort of framing was in the weeds in the sense that it was a debate about how human rights organizations ought to orient themselves. Mine is kind of broader and less in the weeds, a forthright criticism of humanitarian inter intervention or responsibly protect across the board, um, whether regarded from the perspective of human rights organizations or otherwise. So given that my presentation will dovetail in this way with Sarah Lee's, I just wanted to note my appreciation at the outset for Dr. Abdulghani's position and the urgency of the desire to see civilians protected in Syria from a brutal war committed by the government against its own population. The challenge from my perspective is that Syria reflects the very problem that humanitarian intervention or responsibly protect gives rise to, which is that the availability of these doctrines depend entirely on the political will of those in a position to intervene. And the political will is made, you know, mobilized on an ad hoc case by case basis that is intrinsically selective. 
So interventions occur only when mixed motives are present. And indeed, on the face of the doctrine that Abdul Ghani mentioned, responsibly protect, mixed motives are permissible. So in other words, interveners are invited to intervene because a humanitarian goal might be pursued in addition to their other strategic um, objectives in intervening. And so, of course, geopolitical considerations will determine the availability of this option as one likely to be pursued by powerful states. The failure to pursue intervention in Syria is thus neither tied to the presence or absence of permissive doctrines in international law, nor is it related to the advocacy or lack thereof by human rights organizations of such intervention. It is simply a matter of the absence of a political will, will to intervene definitively to protect civilians in Syria. And that is the consequence of the geopolitical considerations of the very countries with the, you know, better human rights records that doc, Dr. Abdul Ghani mentioned, namely countries like the United States and the UK and France and Germany. He and I might disagree as to the human rights records of these countries, but we might agree nonetheless that they would be the only likely interveners and their failure to intervene is not tied to the absence of the doctrine, but rather to the very character of the doctrine that would permit such intervention. Namely, they need only do so when it serves their own interests. And indeed, Dr. Abdul Ghani mentioned this in his presentation and said it is obvious that states will only act on the basis of their interests. And to the extent that this is true, it should be equally obvious that they will be guided not primarily by human humanitarianism in intervening, but by a range of other issues and considerations, including force protection for their own combatants in any intervention and uh, the range of strategic objectives they might be pursuing. And that this is the reason that military force is especially dangerous in the name of humanitarianism, because the objectives of those intervening are disconnected from the humanitarian welfare of civilian populations and are very likely and indeed empirically have systematically endangered rather than serve the interests of civilians on the ground, notwithstanding the purported humanitarian inter inter intentions of those intervening. So this brings me to the reason for the title Humanitarian Paradox in the paper that I wrote. And I'll just say, uh, I'll tell you the argument very briefly and also the upshot. So the argument is that coercion ranging from the use of broad-based economic sanctions, so not just military coercion, but also economic coercion, but also including, of course, military intervention, has been overused by U.S. and Western policymakers since the 1990s uh, and justified on the grounds of advancing purported human rights goals, whereas, in fact, the collateral consequences of such coercion has systematically endangered human rights in most circumstances rather than protecting them, and instead, what Western policymakers should do is prioritize engagement ahead of confrontation, addressing the causes of atrocity crimes and seeking to shift the incentives of those engaging in them, while also one should demand that Western countries freeze military aid to regimes that target civilians. Now, this, this idea of prioritizing engagement suggests that the principal leverage that's available to Western interveners is actually with respect to their own allies and countries with whom they have relations rather than their adversaries. Of course, we know that intervention almost uniformly is against their adversaries, but again, is no guarantee. So being in an adversarial relationship with these Western countries is no guarantee that intervention will materialize, hence the selectivity. It will materialize when a geopolitical objective can be pursued at very low cost with limited likelihood that the engagement will result in harm or cost or blowback to those who are intervening. And the challenge in a case like Syria is the presence of another large military actor like Russia on the side of the regime, which means the prospects of humanitarian intervention are reduced to zero, regardless of the urgency of the need, uh, the sharpness of the advocacy in favor of such intervention. Now, let me just step back, and I know, again, I have limited time. So let me focus on my claim that the problems with the argument in, in favor of using military force to advance human rights are both that such military forces ability to advance human rights is empirically falsifiable and that the claim that military force can be used for humanitarian ends is normatively dangerous On empirically falsifiable. I think many of the most recent empirical records from Somalia and Rwanda in the 90s to uh, Libya and Iraq and in the more recent period have already been named and addressed to some extent by both of the earlier presenters. Um, but it is worth noting that the use of military and economic coercion to achieve humanitarian ends has left populations across a wide swath of the Muslim majority world facing stark deterioration in their welfare and their capacity to realize human rights 
especially in those countries where interventions occurred purportedly on humanitarian grounds. This is due to the misalignment of interest between interveners and civilians, but more importantly, the collateral consequences of military intervention, which is rarely addressed on food supplies, medication and sanitation infrastructure, and economic productivity in the country that has been targeted after the intervention. Now here, I would agree entirely, and so if this panel were titled differently, not about humanitarian intervention or responsibly protect, but rather about responsibility to rebuild, then I, I think my presentation would dovetail entirely with Dr. Abulgani's, because if indeed there was a doctrine of responsibility to rebuild that was anywhere present in the international system, these collateral consequences might be addressed. But in fact, instead what we have is powerful states intervening with near total impunity for the consequences of their interventions, including impunity for the civilian harms directly inflicted, namely the deaths of civilians at the receiving end of high altitude aerial bombardment campaigns designed to protect combatants from any likelihood of casualties while maximizing the sort of dangers to which civilians are exposed in a humanitarian intervention, but also total impunity from any obligation to rebuild the infrastructure damage. And here Libya is really um, an important example. And so while I agree with Dr. Abdul Ghani that the interveners cannot be held responsible for the failure of a political transition in Libya, they can absolutely be held responsible for the collapse of infrastructure and state capacity in Libya because it's a direct result of the aerial bombardment to which that country was subjected. That's on the empirical side. So I'm just going to close my comments with the reasons that I think it is normatively dangerous to militarize human rights in this way. The first is that this risks having human rights and the language of norms become a kind of sinister new weapon in the arsenal of Western powers that deploy this weapon selectively, making human rights promotion a strategy of coercion by uh, the West against its adversaries. Uh, and this is, of course, exemplified by the fact that human rights abusing friends are never subjected to even talk or risk of intervention. But more importantly, that the selectivity means that only adversaries are ever at the receiving end of human rights uh, motivated aerial bombardment in a way that actually erodes the normative force of human rights themselves for those populations targeted, but also for the vast majority of countries in the global south that can neither um, mobilize human rights norms in name of their own military actions, nor resist when Western powerful states intervene once again in the periphery of the international system on the in the name of human rights. The militarization of human rights also further erodes the prohibition on the use of force. In other words, it is a new doctrinal basis for engaging in selective military action, neither on the basis of self-defense nor on the basis of collective security and against the backdrop of American primacy. And here you can see where my comments really dovetail with those of Sarah Lee. Uh, legitimizing human rights intervention runs the risk of serving as a general license for Western or US led interventions whenever would be interveners have the political will to so do independent of the humanitarian reality on the ground, for example, to wit, the far lesser humanitarian costs that had been imposed in Libya prior to that intervention than those that were already in evidence in Syria at that time. Uh, two more points on the normative challenges before I close. There are significant opportunity costs that arise when human rights resources are diverted to militarism. This is also true of the prosecutorial turn of accountability through international courts which Dr. Abdul Ghani touched upon, but I'm not going to speak on that. It undermines available resources to actively promote and protect human rights. Hundreds of billions of dollars get spent in militarism, as we're seeing in the case of Ukraine at the moment as a result, uh, as, a, as an example. And this is at the price of the provision of substantive humanitarian assistance. Today, for example, the coercive economic framework that applies in Syria is impeding humanitarian relief efforts to aid those that are the victims of very significant damage and destruction that's been wrought by these two earthquakes that most recently struck the region and is an extension of the kind of opportunity cost that models of humanitarian intervention and just more generally reliance on coercion generate. And it also displaces alternative diplomatic avenues. Syria here again is a case in point. Um, there has been an overwhelming emphasis, and by the way, it's worth noting that the United States has been intervening simply in a limited fashion in Syria since 2012. Um, directly and accelerated since 2014 under the rubric of counterterrorism, overt and covert programs to fund, train and supply rebels, later open intervention and periodic airstrikes with hundreds of troops on the ground in Syria. All of this has 
involved allocations of hundreds of millions of dollars, most of them misspent, as in the Pentagon's misguided effort to train 15,000 rebels between 2012 and 2015, later canceled by the Obama administration and later the CIA's covert programs, uh, later canceled in 2017 by the Trump administration. These amount to $1.5 billion spent on covert operations in Syria and not spent on humanitarian supplies. But also in that same period, this emphasis on um, militarily changing the balance detracted from the Geneva and other processes that might have actually shifted incentives in a way that could have persuaded the governments to limit the kinds of damage and atrocity imposed on the Syrian population. So I'll stop there and I look forward to hearing Aicha's comments. Thank you. Thank you very much, Asla. Aisha, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Noah Abu El Daib and Georgetown University for this invitation. Uh, I was very curious about the comments from uh, Professor Asla Balu and also from Dr. Fadel Abdul Ghani. Uh, but I would also like to thank uh, Sarah Lee Wixen for this very stimulating uh, article uh, titled Human Rights Organizations Should Not Be in the Business of calling for war. For the most part, I agree, although I will engage closely with what I've read, this pre-circulated paper. I have articulated my own position on humanitarian intervention in my book, For the Love of Humanity, the World Tribunal on Iraq, which has two chapters, one on human rights watches, uh, evaluation of the war in Iraq, especially the special tribunal through which uh, President Saddam Hussein was executed. So I've been following uh, Sarah Lee Whitson's work for a while. I think I believe at the time she might have been the director of the, its MENA region. So I have critiqued Human Rights Watch uh, on very similar terms that she is doing in this paper. Uh, also Amnesty International, their approach to the new constitution initiated uh, uh, in Iraq after the intervention which was propagated to be in the name of human rights as well as the elimination of uh, weapons, counterterrorism and whatnot. So I will save those comments. I've also written on the responsibility to protect uh, in the case of Libya. What I will do instead in my limited time is raise three questions for Sarah Lee Whitson and the article we've read. I highly recommend it to everyone, especially in human rights organizations. My first point is rather uh, philosophical, uh, perhaps. Uh, in the section, in the primary section of the article, uh, in a section I was surprised not to hear about, uh, Sarah Lee actually posits the right to life as inconsistent with, uh, let me put it this way, she argues that calling for humanitarian intervention is inconsistent with the mandate to uphold human rights, primarily on the basis that the war violates the right to life. So uh, I, I would like to question this assertion of inconsistency, not only because Many of those who did support, for example, the occupation of Iraq in the name of human rights or the uh, intervention in Libya in the name of saving lives or are calling for an intervention in, in Syria uh, in the name of protection of life do not happen to think so. But also I would like to question this positing of an inconsistency between humanitarian intervention and the mandate to uphold human rights on the basis of international humanitarian law itself. Let me explain. As Sarah Lee Whitson uh, cites the, in, uh, the Covenant on Civil and Political uh, Rights says every human being has the inherent right to life. No one should be arbitrarily deprived of this life. And the arbitrariness in question uh, is important to consider what constitutes 
constitutes an arbitrary deprivation of life. Precisely those humanitarian interventions that are conducted in accordance with international law, whether international public law or international humanitarian law, take away the claim to arbitrariness and therefore are not seen to be arbitrary takings of life. So in other words, they are legal killings, right? Lawful killings in, in accordance with international humanitarian law. I think if we are going to champion the right to life, we should go further. This is my argument uh, than wh what Sarah Lee Whitson is able to do or prefers to do in this paper and question the whole framework of international humanitarian law, which provides legal grounds for the taking of life. Um, so why not question international humanitarian law uh, in its totality to the extent that it legalizes, legalizes through the principles of proportionality and necessity, the killing of civilians? So why not go further than that? And why not ask human rights organizations to question the, uh, the fundamental principles of international humanitarian law, primarily of military necessity and proportionality? Um, so in other words, I do not think death and civilian death only re results from the violation of international human humanitarian law, but it also results from its very application. Uh, so why stop there? So that was my philosophical slash political uh, point. Uh, I could go on and on about this. I've written about this, but I won't do so. Here. The second uh, problem I would like to raise uh, with regard to what I've read, uh, again, I'm mostly sympathetic to the article, but uh, it's about the myth of neutrality or what I would prefer to call the problem of neutrality with human rights organizations that Sarah Lee Whitson is critiquing. I was a bit unsure what to make of her own interpretation of neutrality, because on the one hand, she seems to argue that Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International, the crisis group, Physicians for Human Rights, etc., are too neutral to the extent, for example, that they cannot call for a ceasefire, they cannot call for peace because their neutrality prevents them from commenting on the legality slash legitimacy of any war. On the other hand, she seems to argue that uh, humanitarian, uh, or these human rights organizations are not uh, neutral enough to the extent that their interpretation of the criteria for humanitarian intervention is not neutral enough, that, quote unquote, these organizations are subjective, that uh, principles of last resort or the imminence of mass atrocity do more good than harm, these organizations are not evaluating them neutrally enough. Instead, they are, I, I'm repeating the language Sara Lee Whitson use, uses, are subjective. Um, so I think it's important to reflect on this problem, the nature of the neutrality in question and why it is problematic if it is. Um, the solution proposed in the article seems to be numerical or quantitative as well as qualitative benchmarks uh, for determining when a humanitarian intervention would be called for. So I was very curious to hear as to what those benchmarks um, might be, which leads to my third and last point, Apart from the critique, the negative critique of these uh, human rights organizations, particularly those based in the West, what exactly is the vision of a good human rights organization that emerges from this 
essay from this important article that should be discussed by every human rights organization. So reading between the lines, one gets the sense that uh, Sarah Lee Whitson would like a quote unquote value driven as opposed to politically driven human rights organizations, organization which would be engaged in a neutral and objective assessment of possible cases for humanitarian intervention. My question is, is it possible or desirable to be neutral and objective? What would it mean to be neutral and objective in these cases? In particular, uh, Sara Lee uh, seems to be, anti uh, to be against the appearance of partisanship the appearance of partisanship when it comes to human rights organizations. My question is, is partisanship the problem here or being the partisans of the wrong parties, such as the United States government or the Israeli government in the cases that are raised as examples? I am not convinced, in other words, that partisanship in human rights advocacy is the problem. How can you be promoting human rights without partisanship. So I would like to uh, pose that as my last and final question. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Aisha. Sarah, Lee, we will we'll come back to you right now. Um, uh, perhaps this is a bit unfair, but I think maybe four minutes of responses. Um, I think especially to what Aisha just said, but also to, to what Fadl, uh, yeah. uh, his remarks from, from earlier. Yeah. And then we'll turn to the audience for questions. Okay. S okay. Sorry. Um, I, I'm probably gonna miss something and I'm glad that I think we're gonna have dinner later so we can <laughs> talk some more and you can remind me of what I missed. Um, but just commenting on, on, on your observations and your comments, um, you know, I, I think that your wish for a humanitarian intervention to save the people of Syria uh, is one that I share. It's a wish. It's a hope. Um, and the problem, I think, is that you have decided that better the U.S. intervening than not, you know, but that, that, that even understanding the problematic nature of a, of a US-led intervention that is not authorized by the UN and so is really, you know, a, 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 a use of force that is not sanctioned by the UN Charter, um, you're willing to take the risk uh, because you're so deeply invested in the situation in Syria uh, and the horrible atrocities there. Um, uh, because you have to do something, you know, that there's a position of desperation. And, you know, my perspective is while I share that wish, I also have the experience of seeing U.S. military forces in action all across the Middle East and the region. And so I don't have that hope or dream that in the case of Syria, things will be different. In the case of Syria, the US will be a good actor and save the children of Syria, even if at the same day, the same moment, it's helping murder the children of Yemen and the children of Palestine. I can't reconcile those two things. For me, it's not possible. So, and I can't respond to something that is ultimately a wish or a hope as opposed to anything that can be materially, objectively, factually be argued and rationalized. Um, I think the only other point I'd make, uh, and I think Asla touched on that, is the notion that the United States didn't intervene in Syria is a myth and a lie. The US was actively militarily intervening in Syria from very early on, as early on as 2013, some even date it before the uprising, um, uh, in the worst possible way, in the most damaging way, by providing weapons to unaccountable, 
unknown proxy forces who went on uh, to spend years, in many cases, terrorizing the Syrian people. And it's not ironic that the only time the US actually militarily intervened directly uh, on the ground in Syria was not to fight against Bashar al-Assad, um, but to fight against the forces that the United States itself had a role in unleashing. Um, and you know, so uh, I cannot divorce or, or make unique or, or pretend that the case of Syria exists in isolation and close my eyes to everything else that's happening uh, uh, to imagine that there's a scenario in which a unilateral US-led military intervention without UN Security Council authorization was going to make things better uh, in Syria. And frankly, uh, I do think there were options in Libya that had a better chance uh, of, of resulting in a peaceful transition in Libya than uh, 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 the, the military intervention for regime change uh, uh, that was authorized by the UN Security Council that Russia and China did not veto because they were promised it wasn't going to be about regime change that did lead to regime change that created a massive political vacuum of warring uh, uh, parties in the country that were armed to the teeth by external actors for many, many years creating the catastrophe on the ground. And something that I hope some scholars will focus on and, and has yet to be documented and written is some important information about the, the suggestion, I can't say it's a fact, that Gaddafi actually offered to leave the country, offered to flee. Um, but that Secretary Clinton at the time was not interested uh, in a negotiated solution, not interested in a quiet departure. She wanted to have a military victory uh, in, in, in her feather cap. Um, and you know, so actually I do think the military intervention in Libya ended up making things far, far worse and exactly reflects the kind of ignorance and blind spot of US policymakers that, oh, we'll just intervene and we'll take out this guy and poof, things will be great. No, if you're going to intervene, you better stick in the country for the next 50 years uh, 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 to, 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 to do the work of repair and rebuild. And frankly, the record in Afghanistan isn't so pretty. So I just, I don't have any facts on which to come to believe that the wish has, has possibility for success. Um, Aisha, in terms of, of, of your arguments, which I find very, very interesting, um, and, and they're actually some of the questions that I grapple with myself, and I'll mention that at the end, in terms of the inconsistency of the right to life with humanitarian intervention, you know, my point very much is to say that the way that it's bridged, the way that the right to life is overcome, is with this body of law called international humanitarian law, which says right to life except in times of war. Right, which is authorized for self-defense or you know, global security and so forth. So it is by even so-called legal killings under IHL, uh, uh, it, from, from my perspective, uh, are, are deeply problematic. And that's why I am frustrated and dissatisfied by the approach of human rights organizations that only look at the violations of the laws of war. Oh, you know, how many people were killed in this attack? And did you give warnings? and never look at the criminality and the, and the violations involved in the decision to go to war, the acts of war that are undertaken that inevitably involve not just your killing, whether legal killing or illegal killing. And you know, have been a long time proponent of the sort of critical legal studies movement of IHL, which sees the whole body of the laws of war as essentially meant to justify and legitimize war and war making by giving it this cover of uh, uh, legality. So I, I hope nothing I said suggests that I am in that camp of, of supporting wars that are lawfully conducted. Um, in, in the broader political context of who's carrying out the war, who has the power to carry out the wars uh, and, and causing the most destruction, I, I am uh, uh, a, a strong critic of the shortcomings of, of IHL. Um, you know, on, on the, the point about neutrality, uh, I, I think that I might have 
my message was not obviously clear uh, to you. It's not that I'm advocating that organizations should be neutral. I'm trying to point out that on the one hand, um, they argue, oh, we, we're, we have to be neutral. We can't take sides in the conflict. We can't condemn the decision to go to war. Uh, we can't, uh, we can't uh, 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 critique uh, militarism per se because it's not a violation of the laws of war. Um, but the one time when they're willing to make an exception to their so-called policy of neutrality is to call for war in humanitarian cases. So I'm, I'm critiquing that notion of neutrality. I don't know that... that if neutrality is meant to be seen as impartiality or freedom from bias, I don't think it's possible for any human being uh, 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 to be devoid of personal biases. But that's why the way to approach these questions, uh, and as Asla points out, in a way that's impossible to do from a political context, is to make it a value-based proposition on the principles based on the facts before our eyes, which I think does require and should require human rights organizations to grapple with the issue of war making. Uh, and that's why I critique the failure of the international foreign policy community to utter any shred of criticism or critical analysis of this war in Ukraine and what will Ukraine look like in five years if the US and Europe keep pumping billions of weapons and you know again as some recent exposés that have come to light in the past few weeks show have refused uh, to contemplate negotiation uh, or diplomatic alternatives uh, in a way that ultimately the Ukrainian people are going to suffer the most from this uh, and and it terrifies me and it troubles me that the the, the general public in the United States backed by corporate America backed by the US government are so hysterically supportive of this exclusively military approach to the conflict of Ukraine. Pretending that it started on the date uh, of, the, of the Russian uh, attack on Ukraine last year, uh, as if there was no background or context to it. Uh, and it's, you know, it's, it's, it's unbelievable. You know, I, I just, I really believe that the same mistakes that American media made during the Iraq war uh, of not questioning, not thinking, not challenging, and the Yemen war. You know, we've been hearing unbelievable propaganda for many, many years without a shred of fact, relying exclusively on US government sources for reporting on Yemen. Now we're seeing this in, in Ukraine. And when Amnesty International, an inch stuck their neck out to document some Ukrainian forces abuses, they were so heavily and severely criticized, including by the Amnesty International staff uh, in Ukraine who said, if you talk about Ukrainian abuses, that's supporting Putin. If you criticize the war in Ukraine, that's supporting Putin. And I heard many of those same arguments in Syria. If you don't support a US military in invasion uh, of Syria, that means you support Assad. Uh, that kind of facile reductivist uh, and ultimately very dangerous uh, uh, thinking it's the dominant narrative right now in the United States. And so many people, I was listening to the reporting today of Biden in, in Ukraine, his little surprise visit. The, the journalists were like practically crying, cheering, oh, you're, you, you, I mean, it's just, that's not your job. That's not your role. That's his job, but it's not your job. Do your job. Ask the tough questions. Um, and, and we're not seeing it. But, the most important question you raise you know, on, on the recommendations and, and the challenge that I personally feel, which is, and therefore I have to read Asla's article, and it is the next workshop that we're organizing, as I was saying to Noha and Asla, you're gonna get an email from me shortly, actually you all will now, uh, is can we construct, can we even conceive of a US foreign policy that is not militarized, that is not coercive, but fulfills its legal and ethical duties uh, to prevent atrocities, support freedom and, and human rights and democracy. Can we even envision and articulate a US foreign policy that serves US national interests? Because ultimately the US government, like any government in the world, is gonna be concerned with the interests of its people, if that, at least that, maybe that, ahead of the interests of the people or Syria or Yemen and so forth. And I don't know the answer to that question, but I think we have to at least try to create, create a vision for a US foreign policy that's different. And, and we don't have it right now. Um, so that's our homework for all of you. <laughs>
Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Okay. All right. So um, I imagine that there are some questions from the audience, so we can start that now. We'll take a couple of questions. When you ask your question, please keep it very concise. Um, it would be great if you could introduce yourself very briefly and um, mention who your question is directed to. And Aisha and Azla, if you would like to step in or anything, uh, if I don't see you raise your hand, just unmute yourselves and jump in. All right, so we had someone over here in the back. Yes, go ahead. And then Gert, yes. Yep. Hi, my name is Rod. I'm a sophomore at Georgetown. Uh, first and foremost, I'd like to thank all of you for coming here today. It's, it's a great honor for all of you to come and speak today. But, uh, but first, before I ask my question, I'd like to preface something. Uh, in terms of humanitarian intervention, I think it's true that the West and any country in general does not like intervene on the sole pre premise of human rights. It's all, always self-interest. I know it's a really realist perspective of it. Uh, Professor Nonman's probably you know, not very happy hearing that, but uh, it's true. I don't think states really have that sense of humanitarian interventionism as the primary objective. It's always a secondary thing, it's particularly with the United States, who has its own self-interest in mind before it does anything. But in, in general, uh, I think that shows limitations of international law in general, which is why I don't think it's really important when it comes to foreign policy decision making. Because at the end of the day, no one really enforces it except the powerful. <coughs> and the powerful tend to be the United States and Europe and these countries, who will use it to justify their own actions, but will never be subject to them themselves. So I don't think using it to justify anything is really valid. But more importantly, this question goes to Mrs. Whitson. Um, how do you necessarily promote human rights in a country, a pariah state like Syria, um, without war? Because it's, it's one thing to sit there and negotiate with someone like Bashar al-Assad, who was you know, gassing his own people, and is, is more willing to keep it, stay in power than anything else. But there is really no other way, from my perspective, than to put boots on the ground in Syria at this point, or at any point, even 2013. Uh, because there really is no other way. Uh, as you stated earlier, we had to stay there for 50, 60 years to create democracy there, I agree. But at the same time, by not intervening, 500,000 people died in Syria. And they're still dying to this day because of Bashar al-Assad trying to stay onto power. So there, I don't see any other way to kind of get rid of Bashar al-Assad because he is a, managing a price at this point than to have war. So my question to you is, what other way is there to get rid of Bashar al-Assad because thank that you. is American interest? Thank you. you know, thank okay, you. Uh, Gerd, you had your hand. Thank you for some very um, uh, thought-provoking contributions. Um, and I, 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 I can see where some of the criticism is coming from, clearly. We all know the record of a lot of Western uh, or US-led interventions. We also know that there's no consistency. It is selective. But then, you know, when was international affairs, when was foreign policy ever non-selective? That's just a fact of international life, right? It's always going to be like this. And the idea that purely because it's selective, one then can never intervene, or one always has to be. I think that's, that's, a, that's just a non-starter, right? Um, so if we start from that pragmatic base, then the, the next thing that worries me in some of this discussion is the focus is really about cr cr uh, criticism of the US. It's, it's, it's the focus is about the US and perhaps the West. The voice of the people of, these, of the countries themselves complete, is absent. The only voice that we've heard in that sense was, was, was yours, sir, right? Um, and I think that this worries me. The, the commentary on what all these poor people of Ukraine, you know, the people of Ukraine, by and large, are more worried about what Putin's doing and Russia is doing and about surviving this and not, not losing all or half their country than about these considerations of, of what we as academics might be thinking in our offices about the, the shortcomings or the, 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 the awfulness about U US foreign policy. So there's a fundamental imbalance, I think, in this whole discussion. Um, OK, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Can, um, Haider, in the back. Um, thank you all so much for coming. My name is Haider. I'm a senior here at Georgetown. I'm a, I'm a student of Professor Noha's Inter International Humanitarian Law class. I wanted to sort of um, ask a question about the responsibility to rebuild that I think Dr. Bali uh, had brought up. And uh, Sarah Lee Wilson, you brought up Afghanistan as an example of how you have to be there for 50 years. The question that I basically ask is, is that even under, let's say, the most um, most ideal of um, conditions, how do you rebuild without it becoming a sort of like, 
uh, without it becoming a case of like what happened in 2021 with the fall of the, the Ghani government, is there an ideal condition without it becoming a proxy government for Western powers? Or are we playing into imperialism over and over? Okay, thank you. Um, he, here in front, this gentleman here, and then we'll, and then we'll come to you, and then, and then we'll come, have to come back to the panel. Thank you, my name is uh, Ahmed Al Ansari. I'm having a problem in the defining the word international community. Uh, the Syrian were let down by the international community, but the international com com community support sometimes, or right, the two, uh, you know, contradictions here. So, what are the inter international? Who who represent the international community? I know for sure there were some states try to do their best in order to mediate and intervene to find peaceful solutions in some war zones, but they've been prevented by superpowers. Aren't they part of the international community? Thank you. One more question. Hi, my name is Aras Karlida. I'm Mustafa Mori at Georgetown. Um, my question is about how these humanitarian interventions or so-called humanitarian interventions can be used to actually justify a regime's rule. Um, because like in Turkey, especially after the 2017 referendum, which made the country turn into a presidential system from semi-presidentialism, we saw like this so-called humanitarian interventions to Syria, like at least in a propaganda way, um, make Erdogan become a more authoritarian figure day after day, after each operation. So how would you comment on these humanitarian interventions or so-called humanitarian interventions allowing certain, uh, let's say, authoritarian um, leaders uh, to gain even more power? This was the case in Turkey, but like maybe it is also the case in Russia through their interventions in Libya or Syria, for example. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Okay, I feel bad though, not taking one more question. Is it super short, Zaina? Um, yeah. Okay, please, and then we really have to come back to the panel. It's, it's also to have a female question from the floor. Thank you. Um, no, I just wanted to pick up on uh, what uh, the gentleman said here. Um, you know, it's, it, there are many of us in this audience who have been impacted by U.S. foreign policy and whose opinions actually do align um, with Sarah. We may not be sitting on the panel, uh, but we are represented here. Um, and it's very much a reflection of the uh, very serious double standard um, of um, the way IHL gets deployed and how the U.S. kind of uh, maneuvers its way through the international system. So that's the first thing. The second thing is when Sarah Lee said that you know, they, that they should be ready to stay there 50 years, we've had a precedent. It's called Japan and Germany after World War II, which right there, that shows you how profound the bias is um, and how, how, how driven it is. I'm not gonna repeat by what, the, what the panel said. So I would really strongly urge that we kind of look at it in a, in a much wider, and there's no way to have this conversation without really questioning the entire structure and architecture of the international relations system, which I think is what uh, the, prof you know, the professors and Sarah Lee were talking about. It would be amazing if you guys can get, come together and come up with a different international order as possible, because I think that would really shift a lot of thinking. Um, so I just wanted to give some context. It wasn't really a question. It was context. It's really not black or white. It's like multicolored, and it's it's top to bottom very biased. And the last thing the gentleman said here, um, and you know, uh, uh, Dean mentioned it earlier. There are so many players in in the international system who are trying to make breakthroughs without resorting to violence or without resorting to sanctions or so on and so forth. But they're really not afforded the same space on the table. Um, and we're sitting in one particular country, which is Qatar. I'm not going to talk on behalf of Qatar foreign policy, but we do know that this country has been central to so many negotiations. And that's just one example among so many others. So there really are so many other ways of, of doing it um, than just the my way is the highway, which tends to be the case. And the last point on Ukraine, um, there's also a wider IR context to what happened in Ukraine, and it's called since the fall of Soviet Union and what the discussion has been with successive Russian presidents all the way till when we got someone who may not be fully balanced in power and who took this horrible step. So you can't really have these conversations without putting them in context and looking at power, um, without looking at the fact that every time Israel bombs the Palestinians, we don't hear anything about it. When the Yemenis were being bombed, we don't hear anything about it. People in the Democratic Republic of Congo every single year are being killed by militias who then are representing certain countries who want to have access to the resources and we don't hear about it. And this is really, really important. 
And I just wanted to give that context. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Zainab. Uh, I'm Syrian and I love my country. I worked uh, 12 years uh, on Syria, and uh, but not be, uh, not based on wish actually, based on facts. I am, on other hand, a researcher. So I mentioned criteria to intervention, which uh, which stage specifically the intervention. I, I think the paper is uh, need. Uh, a bit uh, to be uh, extended, but due to the time. Briefly about Syria, there is like the Assad regime uh, uh, c continuous killing. There is this uh, 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 UN report. Then uh, the UN Security Council failure. Uh, by the way, there is no UN sanction, so, so th there is no any types of graduated steps against Assad from the UN. There is no economic sanction. They didn't impose economic sanction, even military sanction. Okay, so, um, and then negotiation didn't succeed. Then uh, killing is continuous and escalated. Then the, uh, the chemical weapons, the mass, the mass destruction, enter and uh, being proved and recently the recent report by the OBCW three reports then nothing been done what does the human rights organization should do keep silence I don't think so if the failure and I think the crimes against humanity is higher than the UN Charter there is this is UN Charter is not a, a holy issue not to be criticized or or we need to actually uh, develop and we need to see where, where, where we failed. I think there is a failure. What to do if the UN Security Council and all of the step, negotiation, sanction being imposed, being imposed against the regime from the West? I'm not a big fan of the West and I agree that, uh, uh, that the US in entered Syria but not against Assad but to defeat ISIS. This is the coalition, and there is he here actually a mess. And they killed civilians, and we documented, and we have a lot of report against, uh, criticized the, the, the US, and they killed 3,100 Syrians. And I always, when I visited State Department, DOD, White House, hi highlighted addressing those civilians. That, that's other uh, matter. But there is no intervention against Assad, uh, real intervention. but. So what what is what is the what is the answer? It, um, if we have all of those criteria and the steps and nothing being uh, accomplished, so what to do the human rights organization? What is the what what is they are advocating for in this failure? So that's the question. Thank you. Thank you, Fadl. Um, Aisha. Could, could we turn to you, um, on the, especially on the question about what is the international community? And any other question that you wanted to respond to from the Yes. Uh, clearly, NATO is not the international community. The European Union is not the international community. The United States of America is not the international community. Uh, all these governmental, even the United Nations Security Council is not the international community. It's, it's all of us and much more than us is the international community. Every human being and perhaps even non-human beings are part of the international community. But those who obsessively and on purpose entitle themselves arrogantly to speak on behalf of the international community are many. Uh, some international relations scholars celebrate the fact that now non-governmental organizations are speaking on behalf of humanity too. But they are in a violent embrace. These imperialist governments, somebody from the floor finally mentioned the word imperialism, which is like the elephants in the room, um, are in a deadly embrace and they have been. And to that extent, there is no uh, contradiction 
between these governments who are instrumentalizing human rights and human rights organizations that are participating in that violent embrace. So uh, I, I am a critic of those who habitually speak in the name of the international community, including the non-governmental kinds. Um, so I wanted to uh, emphasize my critique. Part of my critique of Sarah Lee's paper is the assumption that there might be some objective criteria that we are failing to evaluate neutrally as human rights organizations. I do not think there is a set of objective criteria that one could evaluate neutrally at all. These criteria are not outside of political uh, contingencies, political contexts, which happen to be imperial. I also do not share or feel rather ambivalent about calling for, for example, the US and UK to stay in Afghanistan for 50 years. What is the difference between that and a colonial occupation? I mean, it's we have to raise such questions. I understand the responsibility to rebuild, but then we have to be very careful, I think, the line between the advocacy of rebuilding a country after its sovereignty has been violated and uh, an argument for continuous occupation over decades is very thin. So those two things stand out for me as uh, in need of emphasis. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Thank you, Aisha. Um, Asla, we'll go to you and then we will end with you, Sarah Lee. Um, Asla, go ahead. Thanks. Um, this has been a, such a rich conversation and I'm really delighted to have had the chance to take part of it. I had, I think, four things that I've noted that were questions or um, comments that to engage with. Um, the first is actually from Aicha's uh, critical pr presentation in her opening. I would just say that the point about arbitrary killing, I would query because when it is very unclear how international humanitarian law rules, particularly around targeting, can operate in a humanitarian intervention, given that the objectives are purportedly humanitarian and not military. So the principles of necessity, proportionality, and distinction are in many ways scrambled. It's very difficult to describe any civilian death as collateral in pursuit of civilian protection. And so actually, I think there is a real argument to be made that in the context of humanitarian intervention, it is arbitrary deprivation of life with or without the appropriate public international law authorization in a use of vellum sense. And so I do think that the point philosophically that Sarah Lee makes of an inconsistency between the right to life and laws of war as applied in a humanitarian intervention remains valid. And then on the neutrality point, I think the core question here is whether organizations can purport to be neutral on you said bellum questions while endorsing humanitarian intervention. I think the answer is plainly no, that humanitarian intervention is essentially a subspecies of just war theory that is directly in tension with any neutrality on you said bellum. And so it's one or the other. And I think there are real reasons to be neutral on you said bellum questions for an organization like the ICRC to be able to provide humanitarian assistance to all parties in a conflict. So I think it's worth engaging with the question of neutrality, not so much in the way you did in terms of objectivity, but in terms of the value it does or does not provide in the humanitarian sphere. On um, responsibility to rebuild, um, I actually view this as a responsibility that is consistent with reparations and restitution for harms done and not occupation and imperial control. So the 50 year commitment is not a 50 year commitment to troops on the ground directing and contractors from the United States or the West profiting from so-called rebuilding contracts, but rather an open-ended obligation to fund under the con conditions of local control, the necessary investments to repair damaged infrastructure or rebuild it in ways that are as, as a sovereign sees fit in a country like Iraq or in a country like Libya. Now this raises its own set of problems about who purports to govern in these territories and we could engage in those. And again, I invite us to have a panel on responsibility to rebuild, but I don't think it involves the control uh, militarily uh, through occupation, 
or imperial um, contracting practices. That's not at all something that I would call for. I do think there are other examples besides Japan and Germany that demonstrate what can be so problematic and what amounts to long-term international territorial administration. Not surprisingly, however, they do not take place in the global south. No global north country is going to absorb the cost necessary to run a country of the global south with a large population and be directly responsible financially for humanitarian welfare in those circumstances. That's why we have an imperial system today that is post-colonial and in, engages in indirect rule. But the places where you will find global north countries on the ground actually engaging in territorial administration is in their own backyard, namely Kosovo, and I think it's deeply problematic there as well. Again, if we ever go into a response to rebuild type of panel, I'd be happy to discuss that. On the question of Turkey, the authoritarian laundering strategy of invoking the language of humanitarianism, I think authoritarians can attempt to do that for domestic audience purposes, but internationally they fail. And this actually points back again to the ways in which humanitarian intervention is really about the identity of the intervener. To be plausibly making a case that your motivations are humanitarian, you need to begin from the position of hierarchical moral superiority that the West presumes for itself. And Turkey is a supplicant with respect to that hierarchy, not at the center of it. And so nobody internationally regards Turkey's actions in Syria as humanitarian. And nobody, I don't think, in an international, that is to say not Turkish forum, would describe Turkish troops on the ground in northern Syria as engaging in a humanitarian intervention. Quite the contrary, they're understood rightly to be an occupying force seeking to disrupt Kurdish goals of self-determination. Um, and finally, on the last questioner's point on the deep critique of international law and the international order, I could not agree more. And I think I would invite audience members to engage with literatures in the uh, tradition of third world approaches to international law that offer both a deconstructive critique of the imperial character of the current international legal order and a set of reconstructive programmatic agendas for how we could reimagine international law in an emancipatory vein. And with that, I thank you again for including me today. Thank you, Asla. I'm so glad that you mentioned third world approaches to international law. Um, we talk about it all the time in class. Um, Sara Lee. I, I mean, I think the questions were, were very uh, adequately addressed, but yet again, the hardest question comes from, from Fadl and, and, you know, uh, and, and the torment of, of the people uh, in Syria. You know, we, I just don't think we get to the answer of militarily intervene by saying, well, there's nothing else. You know, what else can we do? You know, it's, it's, it can't be a default uh, place that we land at because we know from everywhere else in the region that that's not going to work either. Uh, at least th that's my analysis uh, uh, of the facts. And, you know, uh, I think that I want to avoid the hubris of uh, my country or me saying, I know how to solve every pro problem in the world and my country should solve every problem in the world, and my country should go and fix Syria, and my country should go and fix Iran. Uh, and I, and the, list go, the list goes on, right? Because that never addresses what my country can do to improve and save people from atrocities and is choosing not to do. There are actions that the United States can take that would not require the firing of a single bullet but would save many, many lives, I believe. And that is by ending US support for the many other Assads in this region. Bashar al-Assad is not alone in his atrocities. 500,000 people have been killed in Yemen. How has that happened? Because the United States has provided the weapons and the intelligence support and the tactical support and the refueling uh, 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 and on and on to enable those atrocities. Much, much easier. Uh, uh, to do good and save people uh, if they would just stop arming and supporting brutal dictatorships, brutal governments uh, in the Middle East where you don't hear about humanitarian intervention. To go intervene, help the people of Palestine. Go. Just stop sending those weapons to the Israelis. Stop vetoing every Security Council resolution exactly the way Russia does on Syria. But in this case, you know, I'm an American and I work in an American organization and this is where I closed. Our responsibility as organizations operating in a Western context by and large, registered and based in Western countries by and large, is to focus on the things that our governments 
can fix, not the things that maybe might help, though we know usually it doesn't work. Thank you, Sarah Lee. Thank you, everyone, uh, for staying with us this evening. Um, part of the aim of this panel was to unpack some of these disagreements and differences, so um, uh, thank you for that. Um, there's a lot to think about. We do have a reception outside. We can continue the conversation there. Um, and thank you, Asla and Aisha, for joining us as well. Um, have a great evening.